Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Mike Volpe with us. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the program. Super psyched. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, now, Mike, uh, you are the fifth employee at HubSpot, which now has over 500 employees, uh, and now you're the C CMO of HubSpot. And so I want to do two different things today. First, I want to talk about the product of HubSpot because this is a show for people trying to market, and so you have a perfect product that they're gonna to wanna to be able to use and learn more about. But then kind of the last half of the interview, I wanna focus on you and how you've actually grown the product of HubSpot. So let's start with HubSpot itself though. Uh, what is HubSpot? Yeah, so we're a marketing software. So obviously it's, you know, we're talking to the growth hacker community, so everyone knows what SaaS is, I don't need to explain, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's marketing software, and I think we're pretty much one of the, our, our uniqueness comes from two angles. One is that we're inbound, and the whole notion of inbound is that customers are now in control and everyone is sick of being marketed to, right? Mm -hmm. We all record shows on our DVR so we can fast forward through the ads. We all use caller ID or don't even have a phone or a desk anymore. I don't have a five by cell phone. I don't have a phone on my desk because I just get cold calls all day. So we have ways of blocking out this interruptive marketing that we used to receive. Um, and so what you need to be doing today as a marketer, as a growth hacker trying to grow a company is how do you do more inbound marketing? And so one of the things that's really unique about our software platform is that it's very inbound marketing focused. The second thing is that it's all in one. So uh, as an alternative to HubSpot, you could hack together a bunch of different tools, uh, but we try to put all that stuff in one place, both to make it simpler, easier, faster, but also to make it more powerful. Yeah. So you mentioned you know all those tools that you guys kind of bring together under one roof. Um, do us a favor for our audience. Tell us kind of the big categories of things that you guys tackle for people that use HubSpot. Yeah, so um, uh, it, it's really, it starts kind of at the top of the funnel and works its way all the way down to sort of the bottom. Uh, so we have tools for, you know, we have a full content management system. Uh, we're launching our new one right now with, you know, fully responsive design and like the flexibility of something like WordPress, but the ease of use of, of something that, you know, a non-coder would actually be able to interact with. So one of us normal humans, one of us marketers can do it. Um, so we have, you know, blogging, content management, uh, we have a full social media set for to do monitoring as well as interactions and track all of that. Search engine optimization tools to track keyword rank and identify good opportunities uh, through to landing pages with A-B testing and optimization features to um, a full uh, you know, contacts database, emails, workflows and scheduled emails and things like lead nurturing, customized lead scoring. Uh, you can link it in with your CRM system, be it Salesforce or something else. Uh, through to a full set of analytics that not only track where where your website visitors are coming from, but also how many of those are becoming leads and which of the leads are becoming customers. Mm -hmm. So you can really do that sort of full life cycle sort of analysis as well. Yeah, which you guys are able to do because it's so integrated. You, you couldn't really do that with separate products doing those same roles. Is that right? That's right. It's so hard right now to say, okay, well, how many new customers did I get from Twitter and which ones were those and how those customers performed over time, what's their lifetime value. And you can do all of that very easily within HubSpot because again, it's all in one place. And, and you know, for cases where maybe there's a CRM functionality, we have a good integration there, but mm -hmm. rather than trying to hack together lots of different things, it just, it just makes all that integration work really simple. So you can get up and running fast and start doing stuff fast and mm -hmm. uh, also leverage the power of all that data across all the different platforms. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned so many categories of things that you guys tackle. One, it's almost unbelievable how much HubSpot does. I mean, it really is kind of staggering. Uh, but I'm wondering, a typical customer for you guys, do they really get deep into HubSpot or are they just really using it as an email platform and maybe one other thing or using it? Are they really using that range of tools or do people really not you know, get the benefit of the full experience? What's been your experience there with that? You know, I think um, the best customers, this is true for anyone who's trying to grow, the best customers use every aspect of what you offer, right? And the best, most successful HubSpot customers use many, many different parts of our platform. But like all platform companies, like think about the things that you use that are sort of more of a platform, whether it's a CRM like Salesforce or something else, mm -hmm. you know, you may only use a smaller portion of it. But if you get enough value from that portion, then it's a great thing and there's a good exchange there. But yeah, I mean, I think like all platform companies, um, you know, we're obviously trying to get more people to sign up for HubSpot. Mm -hmm. 
but we're also trying to, you know, we start to do, you think about customer marketing, how can you get your customers to use more of your platform as well? And, you know, I don't think we were going to talk too much about that today, but mm -hmm. that's kind of another topic that maybe yeah. at some point in the series you would think about because that stuff is important too. Yeah. Once you've gotten people in the top of the funnel, how do you keep them and how do you make the customers more value, you know, lower your churn rate, things like that? Oh, absolutely. And in my opinion, that's all a part of growth hacking too. So, I mean, we're not yes. just customer acquisition. I mean, the whole funnel is exciting to this audience, so I totally hear you. But you, you speak on so many topics that we'd have to have you on a few shows to really, <laughs> you know, I've seen all the, all the conferences you speak at and all the talks you give, and they all look so good. I didn't even know where I want to take this today. Um, you know, not to have you name competitors, that's not my goal here, but is is this the really only fully integrated solution? Because, I mean, I honestly don't know of any other ones that do all of these different things. Yeah, I mean, I... I'm biased, uh, you know. I uh, orange blood runs through my veins because uh -huh. uh, I've been a house potter for so long. But yeah, I, I we don't really see anything out there that's um, that has both the breadth and the depth of the integration that we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that being said, I would say that the 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 biggest com competition that we would run into would be somebody trying to do something like a take a social platform like a TweetDeck or a Hootsuite mm -hmm. uh, and then try to integrate that with some sort of an analytics platform like, um, you know, maybe like a Google Analytics or even maybe something more like an Omniture or something like that, yeah. along with some sort of like an email or maybe like an automation system like an Eloqua or Marketo or a Pardot or something like that, mm -hmm. um, uh, plus some sort of a content management like a WordPress or, you know, Drupal, Joomla, something like that. People are trying to – some sort of a technology stack that looks somewhat like that. And and parts of those things are open source and, and free, mm -hmm. although the our co-founder says <laughs> – well, yeah, exactly. Our co-founder says, you know, uh, free software is like – it's free like puppies are free, right? And, <laughs> and you know, awesome. it's like, oh, here's a puppy. The puppy's free. But, you know, you got to go to the vet. You got to take care of it. You got to buy – food, you're going to buy stuff, you're going to buy, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's that aspect to it. And then our, some of those tools are actually also relatively expensive. So I think when you look at the overall value, we feel like it's there. Um, but HubSpot is definitely not one of those, you know, 20 or $50 a month products. It starts at a couple yeah. hundred bucks a month and goes up from there. And there's companies that spend a lot more than that with us too. Well, let me ask you about that because, you know, I'm around the startup crowd a lot and HubSpot is a juggernaut. It does everything they could ever want it to do. And yet so few startups, they, they'll add up or they'll say no to a HubSpot, but they'll say yes to 10 other tools that cost more combined. Uh, why is yeah. that? Why do they make that decision? Because I see that decision being made a lot and it seems like it's the mid-level business that really gets HubSpot because they don't care about the budget as much, you know? Why don't startups do yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> I would say, so I would say, uh, especially for unfunded or maybe they are low, like seed or below sort of funded startups, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. For startups that have maybe done an A round or a bigger round, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we're really successful with a lot of those, and I, I think. But I think you're right. I think for that that profile of startup, um, people are very. I think they they don't the the value that they place on cash mm -hmm. leaving their pocket is very very different than the value that they place on their time. And um, I don't know what the right equation there should be of how you should value that, but mm -hmm. I would think if you put a price on your time and compared it to the amount of time and effort it gets to pack all that stuff together mm -hmm. versus what you would have to pay household for it, I think there, I think it works out very, very favorably. But I think again, a lot of people don't necessarily make the make the evaluation that way. So no, I, I totally um, you know, I, I do, I do think long, long term, I and mean, we're very, we were a startup ourselves, and we still think of ourselves as a mm -hmm. startup. Um, you know, our co-founder, Darmesh, is an avid angel investor. He's invested in my last count over 40 different startups as an angel investor. He's very passionate about this stuff. He runs the blog on startups. So he's a big part of this community. We all feel like we're a big part of this community. We would love to have a better solution for that specific type of company. Yeah. Um, and, and we did. And to be honest, we just don't have the perfect thing yet because we know what people want is kind of 50 bucks a month. Yeah. And then they want it to do like all this stuff. Um, and we just haven't figured out a good way to make that customer profile really both successful mm -hmm. um, and profitable for us. But it is something we think about a lot, and it's um, we have a few ideas down the road to get there. But um, you're right; there's it's uh, that particular segment is not the best segment for it yet. Yeah. But I I think it I think it could be. I just think it's the time value of money that people put on their wallets. No, you know? Absolutely, because I've done it that way where I've hacked together the ten products. 
um, it's maddening. I mean, it's, and, and it doesn't really do what you need it to at the end of the day also because the data is not talking to each other. Um, and, and so that's why I ask is because I've done it the old way. And I want to encourage people to consider HubSpot if you're watching this, even if it seems like it's you know a little bit out of your price bracket or what you're used to, if you factor in your time and you factor in all the tools you're going to use anyway, I mean, I'll give you an example. My MailChimp costs for some of my projects are astronomical, and yet I didn't factor that in on day one when I got their free trial. <laughs> you know? Right, right, exactly. But now yeah, I've yeah. actually grown an audience, and now it's just unbelievable. And we're like, look, server costs less than MailChimp. I mean, but we just don't think about it that way sometimes early on. So that's why I want to kind of go there for a minute. Um, in your intro video to on the HubSpot homepage, I, I like it because you guys mentioned that you like it when people audibly gasp at something it can do, at something it's able to achieve, right? Give me some examples of those kind of moments. What are some of the ways that data is integrated or some of the tools or, or some of the things that when it does it, people are like, is this magic or is this real? What is this? <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's lots of it's those and it's usually those things are interesting. It's usually those are like these little things, right? Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you one example. All right. If you're using some sort of a social platform, you're doing you know social media marketing, right? And you're you're pumping out a bunch of tweets and Facebook messages and whatever. The analytics that most of those platforms provide are the number of clicks that you're getting on any one of those messages. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, but we have the ability to tell you who. So if there's someone who's in your database that you've been emailing and nurturing and doing all this stuff for, mm -hmm. and then you post a tweet from HubSpot, and one of those people that's in your database, so we've identified who they are, mm -hmm. and it's one of those people who clicks on your tweet, you can see the analytics for any individual social message, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, within HubSpot, and you can see like the faces of the people, and you're like, oh, it was that person who clicked on it. And guess what? Then if you're like trying to sell to someone, and that's like one of your hot leads, you're like, oh. They just clicked on my tweet. This is a really good time to call them or email them or depending ah, on your business model, yeah. like how it all works, whatever, right? And that data integrates back into the contacts database. So what if you wanted to trigger a nurturing campaign off of social interactions? Mm -hmm. What if you wanted to say, okay, well, here's the segment of people that are highly socially interacting with my company, but they're unlikely to purchase anything from me. But what I want to do is send them some sort of promotion that they'll share with their friends. Right. You know, and build that sort of evangelist base. You can do things like that. So taking yeah. that's one example of taking some of that social data and integrate it in with the contacts database and then giving you the power of that across email and other things. There's there's all sorts of stuff you can do. Um, maybe one other example would be we have this smart content module. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to not only nurture someone by email, and email we typically usually segment and personalize to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, that's a super smart thing to do. But most people today are not doing a job of personalizing their website and showing different content to different segments of their audience. Well, it's hard to do. You can do that with HubSpot, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's like, okay, well, I've got you know MailChimp or something set up, and I'm sending this person this type of email, this other person something else. Mm -hmm. But then they're all coming back to the same exact website. Mm -hmm. Well, with HubSpot, you can say, okay, well, for this segment of people, send them this email, and then show them this on the homepage of the website, right? Yeah. So you can tell them to target people, things like that. And that's, again, using the contacts information with the content management system. Yeah. So it's that integration across things that's sort of cool. And it's the little things like that that – most marketers are like, wow, you, I thought only Amazon and Netflix could do stuff like that. And you're like, no, like there's tools available that let normal humans be able to do this stuff. No, that's the way it feels. It feels like something that only Amazon should have. If I can, When I can make my funnel that efficient but without A-B testing, just like yeah. beforehand going in, knowing this is what I need to do, it, it is. It's, it's pretty amazing for sure. Um, let me ask you this. In your opinion, you know, you see the whole product. You know every little bit and corner of it, what it can do and how it can work. What's one of the most underutilized features that you think is just really great that just nobody talks about, nobody cares about, but you think it's awesome? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a data guy, and my, my MBA is from MIT, mm -hmm. and so our analytics I just think are really cool, and I just love the ability to be able to dive in and know – who became a customer? Mm -hmm. And if you're an e-commerce business, that's typically actually not that hard. Mm -hmm. But because we have this integration with the CRM systems, if you're an offline business, like for instance at HubSpot, um, all of our sales go through a human. It's a it's relatively short sales process, usually 60 days or less, but they go through a human. And usually most companies just sort of lose touch there. And it's sort of like, okay, well, I know I drove this many people and this many leads, but mm -hmm. then they went into the CRM system. Not really sure what happened after that. Or I have to run reports just in the CRM. Mm -hmm. But all the analytics that really show me like, okay, well, 
you know, this many of the leads from hubs from, you know, this particular source, maybe, you know, from SEO or this particular keyword became, you know, this many visitors became leads and this many of those became customers. It allows you to really hone in on the things that are not just generating leads, but are actually generating customers and then say, oh, well, that's interesting. It seems like this type of a term for SEO is not is driving leads, but not driving customers. Mm -hmm. This other type of a term is driving customers. Maybe I should start blogging more about that second category of stuff than the first category, you know, things yeah. like that. Uh, they really sort of help you optimize your time because it's a full funnel analytics. And I just love mucking around in all the reports. Yeah, I think that's a good phrase, full funnel. Because we all think yeah. we have full funnel, but if we don't know what actually led to the person pulling out a credit card, we don't have full funnel, <laughs> you know? Yeah, a lot of times and we, we, and we track all the steps along the way. And if you want to say, okay, well, for people who viewed this page of my website, how many of them became a customer? For people who, you know, how many of them didn't become a customer? What about this other page? You can, you can, if you really want to dive in and do that stuff, you can. You can program in custom things like, you know, track this as an event and tell me how many people became a customer or didn't if they clicked on this video or they did this other thing. So there's, there's lots of things like that. If you really want to geek out in this stuff, it gets yeah. pretty deep. Uh, but I would say just in general, like the reports and that full funnel analytics, that's what Absolutely. I love. Absolutely. And it seems like, I mean, the more creative you are, the more powerful you can make this data set. I mean, if you really sit down and spend the time with it and get creative about how you're matching up the data and what you're looking for, it's really about knowing your own business. And then you guys just provide what you need to, to figure things out if you're creative enough. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about the growth of HubSpot now, because uh, this has been a, an amazing story. Uh, since you've been with HubSpot, the company, I believe, has grown from 10 customers to 8,500 customers. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And when you took over, uh, when you were promoted as CMO, uh, Halligan, and Halligan's one of the co-founders, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Brian Halligan, um, yeah. He had a great quote about you. He said, quote, uh, that you had built a scalable inbound lead generation machine for HubSpot. <laughs> <laughs> if, that, if that's not a great quote to put on a business card, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so let me ask you this. A machine usually has many components kind of working together. So talk me through the machine that you built at HubSpot. What are the components? What do they do? Tell us about your own marketing now, not just what HubSpot does for others. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. And I actually think that the most interesting thing is, is all the stuff you're talking about. So, um, uh, I haven't yet found the machine. I keep walking around waiting to find this machine where I dump in a bunch of diesel at the top and maybe uh -huh. some oil dripping, but the thing's kind of running, making a lot of noise. Uh -huh. But I have found all these marketing people around the company. So I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about what they do. Yeah, right. Please, so, please. um, uh, Overall, I've got the, the the real the lead generation portion of the machine is what I'll talk about, which is about probably I don't know at this point uh, probably about twenty five people because okay. um, the company overall is about five hundred. The marketing is about fifty total. Mm -hmm. So the lead generation portion, we have a top of the funnel team and we have a middle of the funnel team. Um, the top of the funnel team, their job and all their goals and metrics are around attracting new visitors to the website mm -hmm. and getting those visitors to convert and just give us their contact information. Mm -hmm. uh, and then their job sort of ends and then it goes to the middle of the funnel team. Uh, and so the top of the funnel team has a lot of people that are creating content because content is an important part of inbound marketing. Mm -hmm. What, what um, kinds of content? What are they creating are, there? Yeah, we do. I mean, so much content and we spend a lot of time there. Um, so blogging, ebooks, webinars, um, infographics, all that type of stuff. Okay. We've got, um, uh, and we do it in all sorts of different topics. Um, and we publish about 60 blog articles a month. Wow. Uh, we're very active within social. Um, uh, and there's also a, a small SEO team, two person sort of SEO kind of optimization team as part of that team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also do, and about 80% of our lead generation comes from all of that. Okay. About 20% of it comes from doing some paid and some co-marketing, and that's like a two-person team. Okay. Uh, so we're very heavily weighted to the inbound portion of the funnel. Those leads are lower cost, and they also close at a higher rate. So they're higher value and they're lower cost. So we try to invest as much as we can in there. And the whole theory behind that portion of the team is how do you become that publication that your target buyer persona wants to consume? So I always tell people, you don't want to be interrupting the thing that people want to consume. You want to be the thing that people want to consume, is right? Is that inbound marketing so, in a nutshell right there? I think it pretty much is. I really do. Mm -hmm. and, and what that means is that you can put an ad next to someone else's blog article or you can just be the blog article. And we've chosen to be the blog article. Mm -hmm. And our goal is for marketers. So for that you know, typically mid-level marketer or a mid-sized company, we want to be the best publication for them to learn about their job. Mm -hmm. And when you read our content – 
it has maybe links back to some product information or maybe will occasionally like slightly reference some product stuff, but there's a lot of it that it really has nothing to do with what our product does. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to be the best publication for marketers. Yeah. Uh, and that works really, really well. We today generate about 70 to 80,000 leads per month. Wow. Now, what do you um, consider and, a lead? Because that's a huge number. <laughs> what is yeah, it? What so is a lead? Huge number, and that, that? Is, it is someone that fills out a form on our site, uh, but, it's a, but it's a new contact name in our database. Now, are all those qualified? No. Do they all buy? No. Do I give them all to my sales team? Absolutely not. Right? Um, but it's a huge, huge volume. This very, very large top of the funnel because we've been so good at building out that inbound portion. Our blog gets about 1.5 million uniques per month. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do ebooks that get 10 to 50,000 downloads. Uh, we actually hold the world's record, the Guinness World Record for the world's largest. They called it an online seminar. I would call it a webinar. Uh -huh. uh, we had over, I think it was 12,000 live attendees. We had 30,000 people register. Uh, it was actually about a year ago on the day of the East Coast earthquake. So that's what that portion of the team does. Okay. The other portion of the team, the middle of the funnel team, takes all those new names that we're getting into the database and all the, the ones that have been in there for a while but are still engaged with us. And they do lead scoring. They decide which leads go to the sales team, which team, which don't. They do all of our lead nurturing. They do sort of our engagement throughout the sales process. And then they work with the sales team to try to close as many of those into customers as possible. Yeah. Uh, and that team is interesting because they're actually aligned not by the activity that they're doing, which is the way the top of the funnel works, but they're actually aligned by different buyer personas. So we have a small business buyer, we have a mid-market buyer, we have an enterprise buyer, we have a nonprofit buyer, and we have some other teams as well. Each one of those teams has one or two dedicated marketers whose job it is to really, really understand that buyer persona mm -hmm. and have a customized sales and marketing process for that persona to go through. So the way you market to someone, you know, a director of marketing ops in an 8,000-person company in the enterprise segment is very different than how you do it to a 50-person company, right, in the small business segment. So we do our sales and marketing differently through those. The way we do that is by having those dedicated middle-of-the-funnel marketers. Yeah, no, that's great insight into how the whole thing works. And I asked that question just because I'm personally curious, you know, and this is my chance to get an insight into how HubSpot grows itself. Um, now, this next question, I only ask to you uh, because you're, uh, you've are you done well enough that it's not a, a slight against you to ask it, <laughs> is what's the what's the weakest part of your machinery right now? And, you know, what is it that you're like, ah, I wish that was a little bit better and we need to put some more people on it, think about it differently. Is there any weak spots or do you just feel like it's kind of all cylinders going right now? I mean... You know, we grew 82% last year to 53 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, things are going awesome, but oh yeah, I mean, we have a million problems. And I think <laughs> that any good entrepreneur is always paranoid, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not paranoid, you'll sort of be, you know, become a little bit more lazy and sort of, you know, uh, sort of um, fall behind. And so, yeah, there's a million things. I think any of the more traditional marketing things we're actually not very good at. So <laughs> I wouldn't put PR into that category, even though I would say we get a lot of coverage, but the coverage we get is because of all the social and all the blogging that we're doing, not because we're good at doing uh -huh. PR yet. Uh, we've got a plan in place. We've got some new folks working on it. I'm optimistic about it. But right now, I think we have some opportunities there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, any of the more traditional stuff, just because we don't do it at all, I don't think we're, we wouldn't be very good at it. We've tried a trade show or two, and we failed partly because I think it's much harder to make those successful. And I think you know we just haven't, we're not that good at it. Mm -hmm. I also think that the the good and the bad about inbound marketing is the top of my funnel, as we were just talking about, is is large. Yeah. It's you know it's a lot it's of big people enough probably top. for your sales team. I, well, that's the thing. And so you need to sort of weed that out. And we do a good job of not distracting the sales team with it because we use software to prioritize and score and do whatever. Mm -hmm. But it would be nice if the conversion rate were higher, mm -hmm. right? So we sell, you know, there's roughly hundreds of new, some number of mid good hundred number of hundreds of new customers per month. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we had a higher conversion rate, that would be fantastic. Now, Part of the, the value of inbound marketing is what you really care about a marketer as a marketer is what's the ratio of your customer acquisition cost to the lifetime value of a customer. Yeah. And I do think with inbound, your conversion rates actually will probably go down, but your costs will go down and your lifetime value should actually hopefully go up as well because people are finding you, not just you're getting a pitch from you. Yeah. And so I do think that overall for the health of the business, it, we, it, it does improve things a lot. But you feel a little weird about it because the conversion rate kind of goes down because you're just, you know, you're throwing this gigantic net into the ocean and fish are just coming to it and swimming mm -hmm. into it. 
um, versus you know doing a lot of work to catch any one of that perfectly aligned individual fish. Yeah. Uh, so it's just sort of a different process. So sometimes I sort of dream about a much higher conversion rate. Mm -hmm. We have some ideas about that. We know which one of our programs convert at a higher rate. There's and there's some ways to do that stuff. Um, and I think over the next couple of years, we'll hopefully make some progress there. But yeah, there's we have a million problems. There's lots of things that want. <laughs> yeah, people watching this are thinking they wish they had the problems HubSpot had. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I do care. I call them country club problems. Or yeah, exactly. Right. Problems, right? Yeah. No, no, that's yeah. good though. That's why I asked because I really wanted to see how you see it as the CMO, you know, of this large thing. If there weren't more problems and challenges, it wouldn't be fun, and I wouldn't be here. So that's right. yeah, that's. I mean, that's. It's been six years, right? That's a long, as long as I've ever worked at any one company. Uh -huh. um, that's a long time, and you know, it's because of stuff like that that it still gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah, you guys are so good at inbound, but you you said yourself, you know, you don't really focus on PR. Trade shows were kind of a bust so far. The traditional stuff. Um, you're not, I wouldn't say excellent at, right? And that's okay because your business works. Like it works with inbound and you don't need to make a trade show work to make the business successful. Like it's irrelevant. Do you think that's a good uh, kind of marketing takeaway that you have to be insanely good at something and you can figure out the rest? Or does that only work with inbound? It only works if you're really good at inbound and that's the one thing everybody needs to focus on. How do you kind of see the landscape? Could somebody be just really good at traditional stuff and make this thing work or is it not really? <laughs> I think it depends. I think the interesting thing is that, um, you know, like like all, when you think about starting a company, one of the things you usually want to tie into is, is can you tie into a part of a broader trend mm -hmm. that will put a little wind at your back, right? Mm -hmm. And I had I know a CEO that I used to work for. I told him, I was like, look, I've been here for four years. It's time for me to move on. I want to do something more entrepreneurial. And his one piece of advice for me was like, go somewhere where you're not pushing on a rope. Right. It's like it's <laughs> like you awesome. want to be on the it would be being pulled by the rope. You want you know, so it's just like you want this force coming from behind you. You want the market to be moving in your direction and helping you. Then the rising tide lifts, lifts all ships, whatever metaphor you want to use. Yeah. And when you're trying to start a company, it's what you want to do. Yeah. I also think you want to do that with your marketing. And I do think that if you're trying to be really good at cold calling or really good at trade shows or really good at direct mail or really good at, you know, radio ads or something like that. Yeah. The wind is in your face on those things. And I'm not going to say you can't make the ROI work because you can make the ROI work. Mm -hmm. And you can get very, very good at them. But I would always want to be someplace where the wind is at my back. And I think more and more people are making buying decisions by searching in search engines, asking their friends in social media, you know, reading blogs, consuming information in that type of a way. And if that's the way the world is moving, I think you're probably smarter to go someplace where the wind is at your back as opposed to in your face. Yeah. But – there are companies that you know get really good at cold calling and make it work for their economics, and you know what? Good for them as long as they don't have my number on their list. <laughs> that's right. No, that's, that's a great answer. That's what I was wondering. Um, let me ask you this: you know, you guys have kind of mastered inbound marketing for yourself and helping other people, you know, use your tool and do inbound themselves. What common mistakes or misconceptions do people have about their own inbound strategies? Because you see companies sign up every day and they're going to begin their inbound strategy. They're going to start and today's the day. Well, what do they mess up on so that people watching this don't have to? <laughs> uh, it, the biggest thing is just assuming that uh, it's going to be easy and not take a lot of work. <laughs> All right, explain um, it to me. Right? I mean, you know, and we're talking about, you know, growth hackers and whatever here and um, it's, it takes time and effort to write blog articles. It takes time and effort to engage in social. Like this stuff is not free. We often talk about HubSpot as it's like joining a gym. <laughs> and when you join a gym, you're paying this, you know, monthly membership fee and there's all this stuff there. But if you never show up at the gym, you're not going to get in any better shape, mm -hmm. Right. And you can't even call up and have the personal trainer like lift the weights for you, right? They can maybe motivate you and send you a text and be like, you're coming to the gym, right? You're going to be here at nine. Like, I'm going to be here. When you're there, they get you pumped up. And, and we have some services and consultants that can help you and do some things like that for you. Um, but it's it's what you, you need to show up and you need to actually put in some level of the effort. And if you do, mm -hmm. all the data says it will work for you, but you need to put in that effort. I think a lot of people sort of get started and just assume that it's something where they can set it and forget it or I don't really necessarily know what they're thinking, but the examples of when it, it tends not to work is mm -hmm. it's more about effort and time dedication than it really is 
about anything else. Yeah. So don't make that assumption. If you're not ready to put in the investment, you like don't become a customer, please. Yeah. You know? And you know, that's yeah. actually a good thing for the people watching this because we all know inbound works. I mean, I have people on the show all the time telling me most of my growth comes from inbound and we didn't expect it or whatever. You know, I mean, it's the common story here where I'm almost tempted to change this to like inbound.tv or something, you know? <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, is like even though we all know it works, it's so hard to do that people drop out, which means it's wide open for the ones who want to do it well. As much as we know it works, people are still looking to consume more content. They're not sick of content yet. No one on the internet is saying, hey, internet, stop, no more content, I'm done. They're saying, hey, more. Their appetites are getting bigger, and so if no one's filling it, it's wide open for the businesses who want to show up at the gym and do the work, right? That's exactly right. There's, there's still a ton of opportunity out there, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you're absolutely right, but it, it, takes, it takes signing up to do that work. Yeah. How important is a brand to an inbound strategy? Because I think about HubSpot, and your all's brand is stellar. I mean, I remember you know years back when it was first starting, I went to a meetup in Florida, and there's some guy there like, HubSpot, greatest thing ever. Let me tell you about him. And I'm like, I don't even know the guy. <laughs> was his name uh, Bernie? You know, I don't know his name. He was an uh, interior okay. designer. Right. I'll tell you that. I may, I may, so I may know him because he was a... Uh, he was at our first event we ever threw. I connected with him on Twitter originally, Bernie Borges. He's uh, Bernie Bay on Twitter. Um, By any chance, was he uh, an interior designer? No. Okay, well, I think we might be talking about somebody different. All right, there was somebody else. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Good. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, we have a brand today for sure. But what I would tell you is that the brand was built through inbound. Uh, I mean, when I started at HubSpot, um, the entire website was blue like the week before I got there. They just changed it to orange, mm-hmm. and no one knew what HubSpot was. We got one lead per day, which was one of Darmesh's startup buddies from his blog on startups coming on to HubSpot and putting in their email address uh, requesting entry into our beta program. And that, and, that was, and that was a lead, just an email address wanting beta, which basically they thought was free, mm-hmm. and that was all we had. Mm-hmm. And today, things are very different than that. So I, what I would tell you is that I think a brand, knowing what your brand is, is important for inbound and sort of what your opinion is of the world and how you want to represent yourself is important. But I think you don't need to have built a brand mm-hmm. to do inbound effectively because I think you can build your brand through doing inbound. And I think, I think we're a great example of having done that. No, that's great. I didn't expect that. I was thinking it was, oh, yeah, we built the brand and then we decided to do inbound. But then once you said it, it's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Of course it was one and the same activity. The first thing I did when I got here was write a blog article. Yeah. I mean, you know, and started doing stuff like that. I started participating in marketing discussion forums and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a brand, I think, helps. Mm -hmm. um, But I think you can build a brand through inbound. Yeah, well, that's great. You mentioned, you know, that was the first thing you did on day one. So let me ask you this. If you were in a startup right now, a new startup, let's say they're bootstrapped. They don't have budget. They can't spend money. They can't do anything. And you're the CMO, right? For whatever reason, you took the job, <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you spend your day doing? Because people are watching this in that kind of situation, but without your knowledge. So what should they be yeah. doing on day one? Uh, you know, I, I made this presentation. I actually gave it at uh, uh, Lassian, mm-hmm. uh, the guys who make Confluence and whatever, and Jira, which probably your audience says a lot. Um, uh, they had this, you know, uh, a conference a couple uh, year or so back, and I gave a presentation about the ABCs of startup marketing. And in there, I think one of the big pieces of advice that I had was um, start blogging, start doing inbound, even before you have a product. Mm -hmm. And I think what's cool now about sort of the whole lean startup movement and growth hacking and things like that is people are starting to come around to this idea that you can build an audience before you know exactly what you're selling to them. Mm -hmm. Because you should know who the buyer persona is and roughly what are the major problems that they have in their lives or their careers and you can just have content and other types of other things, maybe some free tools or things like that, that are appropriate for them that they will love and enjoy and share with their friends, mm-hmm. but it's not it doesn't take the time and effort to create as much as like building a full-fledged product, right? Yeah. And so the first thing that I would do would say, okay, well, we need to do some research to figure out who we're selling to, mm-hmm. and then we need to figure out what are their key problems, and then we just need to figure out how do we help them with those problems before we have the product ready to sell to them. And so to me, I think blogging is a big part of it. Maybe it's videos, maybe it's podcasting. Depends on your audience and what type of content they prefer the most. Mm -hmm. But that's what I would do. And then, lo and behold, three, six, nine months later, once you have a product to sell to them, you actually have their time, their attention, you know, their trust Mm -hmm. um, at the point at which you're like, hey, now I've got this paid beta program or, you know, free trial or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You can then launch that and you have them ready to go. 
it always frustrates me when some group of you know three, four, five developers, you know, corner me here somewhere in Boston or some event or wherever it is, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Hey, we're going to launch next week. How do we start doing some marketing?" <laughs> and I'm sort of like, "Okay, I can give you some advice, but you're six months too late. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were doing this six months ago, you'd be like, oh." How, what tips do you have to launch to our 20,000 blog readers? And I'd uh, write a blog article about it. Like, it's that simple, right? Uh -huh. So, yeah, so I, I think you can start a lot of this stuff earlier. Um, and and that's, that's the type of things that I would think about. No, that's great. That's great advice for people watching this. Because um, a lot of people watching this, they haven't started building yet, but they can start <laughs> blogging. You know, we're going to have people yeah. all over the spectrum here. So that's awesome. Um, let me ask you a couple questions about kind of the future of marketing, uh, the way you see it. Because you're kind of closer to the edge than most of us. So my guess is, you know, you can see into the future a little bit more clear maybe. Um, what's the next thing for inbound marketing? Because when I think about it from my vantage point, which isn't that well, um, I think, okay, it's blogging. We kind of got that figured out. It's social. We kind of got that figured out. Like it's all kind of known quantities. What's next? Like what's the next inbound thing? Is there a next inbound thing or is it just refining the ones we already have better and better? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the things we have will definitely get better and there'll be a lot of new tools out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of big, I know a lot of things that, that I think will help, but I would say that, um, I think that the notion of personalization, I, I think is going to become more and more important, mm -hmm. uh, to how you think about inbound. When I think about inbound, there's one part of it that is about sort of like content and providing value. There's another part of it that is about context and about, the right content is going to work for the right person at the right time. And that person time aspect of it is about the context. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. So we made this, this email that we use as part of a, a re-engagement series. So for leads that have come in, downloaded something from us, our salespeople call them back a couple times. If they're unable to get in touch with them, they mark them in the CRM in Salesforce as unable to contact. That then updates HubSpot, and then HubSpot sends an email to that person from me. As I wanted to be highly personalized, I wanted to not come from the sales rep. And it has a video of me um, sort of jokingly running around avoiding a bunch of calls from sales reps. And so it's because we sell to marketers, so they're, they're, my, they're my people, right? Yeah. And, um, and we're trying to re-engage them. And that email has a 16% click-through rate, uh, which for a re-engagement email for an audience that is not engaged with you is about you know five to six times higher than you could ever possibly expect. Maybe almost 10 times higher for some of them, right? So it's, it's, it's a pretty high engaging email. But it's again, it's the right content in the right context. I gotcha. The same exact email was sent as, as on purpose, but it was a mistake to do it by an intern on our, one of our teams mm -hmm. to a group of people that were leads that we weren't trying to call because they weren't a great fit for us. Mm -hmm. And this intern looked at the email and said, wow, this is performing really well. Let me try to engage these people with this email sent it and the click through rate was like two percent and i i got a lot of replies of like what do you mean you've never called me i'm not ignoring your calls like, all this uh, stuff right because they were pissed off by it mm -hmm. so same exact content so that's why i take issue sometimes with the notion of content marketing although content is really important is an important part of it mm -hmm. but you need to think about that context of like how you're using that stuff so i think getting smarter with how we think about inbound mm -hmm. and respecting that context how can you adapt your website to who's visiting it how can you better adapt your your email to who you know it's going from. How can you use more information about people, their social engagements with your company, their website engagements with your company, mm -hmm. all that stuff to really make that make that inbound connection better. And I think that we're in our product launching some stuff and have launched some things that help you sort of make those connections more. Mm -hmm. uh, working on more things that we will launch that will help there too. But to me, it's that area that's sort of a big part of the forefront of inbound marketing. Yeah, that's great. I love all the stuff you said about context. That helps me so much. Um, this has been an awesome interview, and I got one last question for you. Uh, kind of a high-level question. You can take it in a lot of different directions. But what's the best advice that you can give to any startup that's attempting to build their own inbound marketing machine? Well, what advice would you have for them? Uh, you know, um, I, there's other, other questions like that that you've asked, but I would yeah. say maybe the new piece of advice that we haven't talked about yet today, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the term, but know your buyer persona. Okay. And so really, really understand who your buyer is. Talk to lots of them. There's lots of hacks of things of people using, you know, combination of uh, Mechanical Turk and Google Voice numbers to talk to lots of people in a short amount of time. Do that kind of stuff. Really get to know your buyer persona mm -hmm. because that will help drive your understanding of the content and the context of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you know your buyer persona really well, um, you're, you'll be able to attract them more. 
And I'm lucky because our buyer is very much like me because I market to marketers. Um, but I think there's many cases where, you know, as a developer, a startup, an entrepreneur, a growth hacker, you're maybe having this idea for a product and it's sort of like you, but you're selling to someone who's a little bit different from you. You really need to understand who those people are, what makes them tick. And if you do that well, it will help you in the product, but it will also help you a ton in your inbound marketing. Yeah, great advice, great interview. Thank you again, Mike, for taking the time and coming on the program. Thanks a ton for having me. This is exciting. Thank you.